Recent years have seen a growing concern with the effective qualities of heritage and the way historic sites can engage our emotions as much as our intellect. But our, our archaeological reports remain on the whole objective and technical. Um, take, for example, prehistoric barrows, those key structuring elements of landscapes. Um, I think they, they have two key qualities of poetry, um, pathos in the form of the remains of the dead in many cases, and metaphor or metonym in the way they encapsulate aspects of the wider landscape through their placement and architecture. Could poetry perhaps allow us to convey some of these ideas better than standard archaeological prose? Um, and I'd like to address this via two English poets of place and landscape, Peter Riley and Roy Fisher. Archaeology may have, until today, perhaps had only a passing interest in poetry, but some poets have a deep fascination with archaeology. In Archaeopoetics, Mandy Bloomfield finds a key point of reference in the American poet Charles Olson's 1949 poem, The Kingfishers, which looks to the practices of archaeological fieldwork to, as Bloomfield puts it, offer ways of imagining how history might have been differently heard. Um, the metaphor of archaeology emphasizes a material encounter, even when the source is excavated, if you like, a textual. And it's not just the text, but also the typology and the layout which contribute to Olson's enactment of an archaeological method. And in, in the, the, the bottom poem, Letter, May the 2nd, 1959, there's a strikingly literal transformation of the page into an archaeological site. Olson called for a poetry of uh, open field composition to replace the traditional closed poetic forms. Now, in a landscape context, of course, open field um, means something else, and poets do always like a pun. So in Poetry and Commons, um, Daniel Eltringham has written about a magazine called The English Intelligencer from the 1960s, an important um, a publication in the, uh, the web of post-war experimental poetry, um, small but influential, um, and its recipients apparently included William Burroughs and J.G. Ballard. Um, Eltringham argues that it revised Olson's open field composition in terms of the historical enclosure of the open fields of England, um, a communal and effective geography that has its own poetic associations, of course, uh, through the work of John Clare. So the open field calls up a, a history of dispossession and forced enclosure while also keeping the association with the form of the poem um, through an archaeological focus on the topography of open fields, their kind of circularity around settlements as opposed to the, the kind of rectilinear enclosure landscapes and their ridge and furrow traces. And one of the intelligentsia poets, J.H. Prynne, who... Um, actually has a, has a published volume of correspondence with Olson, um, connected the motion of the plough along the ridge with a metrical understanding of space on the page. And more recently, the poet um, Harriet Tarlow has written about how open form uh, page space is closer to an open field or a moorland or a hillside than are closed forms of poetry. Um, so there's medieval landscapes, but while um, Prynne discussed ridge and furrow with Olson and lauded uh, W.H. Hoskins and his view of the landscape, another intelligencer, Peter Riley, was more interested in prehistory. Indeed, he wrote a treatise on the Neolithic, which is rather charmingly entitled Working Notes on British Prehistory or Archaeological Guesswork One. Um, and he also lampooned archaeological approaches in a poem called The, the Antiquary, um, I dug the soil and peat over the hills, and I found in 20 years a flint arrowhead. Um, <laughs> uh, Riley has written that the, the project of, of him and, and Prynne and the others was a campaign to assemble believers for a new cultural dispensation traced through etymology and archaeology to the remote past. But he also notes that this archaeological philosophy has always been difficult. It's not just digging up the bones, but ventriloquizing them. What Riley was interested in getting at was the point at which private property um, began. So he picked up on some tropes that are familiar to prehistorians. I think the Mesolithic, Neolithic transition, as in the extract there from, from due north, 
um, and the contrast between communal and individual burial with grave goods indicating the moments when there is a change from a, an earlier community of flesh um, to a point where, as he puts it, man's life had become his possession, like his dagger and his bow. So, in Riley's collection, Excavations, he digs into the texts of Mortimer and Greenwell's 19th century Barrow excavations in Yorkshire. These are prose poems that mix up fragments from the excavator's reports, early modern lyrics, and his own text. Um, and in a later interview, Riley says that his interest in archaeology slotted straight into the quest for an expanded poetic in the 1960s. And here's his take on, on um, the role of a burial in these Bronze Age um, barrows and also what his project was, was trying to get at. Um, why do this, he asks rhetorically. And his answer is, because it's there, because you can't just have the world as a present given. It's not made that way. There's always something else, lost, destroyed, pulverized, spoken, and perished 4,000 years ago, which makes a kind of edge to what we are. Now, I think it's hard to get a better defense of doing prehistory than that. Um, I'm, I'm going to show a few of these poems ne next to the original text for the same barrows from uh, Mortimer and, and Greenwell. Just want to give you the idea, I know there's not time to read everything, but in the, sp in the spirit of the poems, uh, you can pick up fragments from the, uh, from the slides. So here are the italicized parts of phrases taken from Mortimer. Um, uh, so there's a reference here to um, a boat in the first line on, on the left. Um, reflecting Mortimer's description of a boat-shaped block of clay, presumably a sort of merely accidental shape, but it launches Riley on a series of sailing metaphors in which death and loss set us towards whatever meaning we can find. And then in bold, we have the, the, the 16th and 17th century lyrics, um, and they're there because he wanted to fill the vacuum between the sort of what he calls the recalcitrant material of prehistory and the author. Um, uh, and he said that period felt like a middle placement between the here now and the prehistoric nowhere, like something we half have. And one thing Riley consistently picks up on is <laughs> Mortimer's references to direction and the cardinal points, as he puts it, they seem instinctively to have realized that it was important which way the body was made to face, both locally and terrestrially. And the repetition of these directions through the poems opens up his, his wider point on, on cardinal tensions um, about these sort of general east, west, and north, south um, metaphors. Here, by way of comparison, is some Greenwell. Um, <laughs> And you can see here there's a quite, quite a large chunk from the, uh, the original text, slightly rewritten, um, about the, uh, the burial of a, of a young child. And then it uh, um, sort of segues into his reflections on a, on, on a motorway, motorway drive with, a, with, with presumably his own uh, child. So in excavations, Riley digs away at, at specific sites, but he's also a poet, as um, Neil Alexander um, puts it, who's deeply engaged with the poetics of place, um, producing representations of landscape that are at once learned, reflexive, and rich with details. His poetry has rigorously anchored itself in place and landscape. So in his long poem, Alston Field, it's just an extract here, from 2003, for example, the writing of place is pursued through the familiar trope of walking in the landscape, and it's very sort of place specific. It names farms, houses, pathways, geological features, and um, tumuli here. So we have another damp Sunday morning, up and walk over Pilo, another distressed tumulus. Um, and similarly, um, walking through the dale, not a serious route since the Bronze Age, millions of lives, simple darkness, and earth noise. Um, so in Riley's wider body of work, perhaps we can locate excavations and its focused sort of theory of history and its emphasis on directions within the, the barrows into a bigger understanding of how place and landscape work to orient us. Now, Alston Field is in the Peak District, and it's here that we, we meet Roy Fisher. Um, 
most famous as a poet of Birmingham and the urban West Midlands, where his work was concerned with precisely rendering urban landscapes and the apparently mon mundane detail of physical surroundings. He later moved to the Peak District, and it's one of those poems I'd like to, to focus on. Um, writing about Fisher, um, He's, it, it, it's been said that his landscape is so deeply imbued with history that even the hills and valleys are a kind of palimpsest. Peeling the present off the past, the better to show the wiring, to quote one of his poems. And Fisher has talked about the influence of place on his, and landscape on his poetics. And in the words of Neil Corcoran, in Fisher's work, landscape undergoes displacement into mindscape. So we have this poem at Broth on No, which is a parallel to Riley's Alston Field, um, Hamlet in Derbyshire, site of a Roman fort. Um, but it generates the impression of multitudes of watercourses, roads, and paths. It feels as though it has in some way been dislocated. It moves and stays put. There's no single place to be at Broth. Um, but equally, Fish is no romantic. And I, I love this quote about Alfred Watkins. Um, and reading him, he did look hard at things before getting them wrong. <laughs> While archaeology may not loom as large for Fisher as for Riley, it does frequently intrude, and Fisher has spoken about his longer-range view, as in the quote on the left. So his major poem, A Furnace, links Newgrange spirals with the space-time of contemporary physics. The cloud chamber that opens this section ends um, in a closing passage um, about a burial site in Brittany, which is made to sound like the core of a nuclear power station. Um, and Claire Wills has written that a furnace straddles the dividing line between world as a place of mystery, the domain of folklore and religion, and world as a set of processes, realism, and natural science. Um, to stay only within the first would be a failure to acknowledge the lostness of the dead, and to remain only within the second would be a denial of their continuing presence. And so to um, download drop, which is the end of this talk, but it was my starting point for the, the paper, um, coming across this poem. So into a poem, that, a long poem that deals with daily life and personal trauma, such as the death by hanging, another kind of drop um, of one of his contemporaries at school, comes a prehistoric moment on the hill called, called Dowlow. Um, like excavations, based on a real site, this time one of Thomas Bateman's excavations. It's also perhaps worth noting that Riley did start on Bateman after Mortimer and Greenwell, but didn't get very far. Um, but this poem just seems to bring together the Barrow's construction, contents, and its loss to quarrying with, um, with succinct perfection. And I like the, the focus on the detail of the rivets, which is uh, of the bronze dagger that you can see on the, on the right in Bateman's account that's sort of repeated through this, um, through this section. So a group, on a day I could hardly be present, a group I guessed at came to the ridge here again and opened the mound, laying there three rivets, a grooved bronze dagger, flakes and a knife of flint, a piece of iron ore and a bone pin. With these things and others, they placed my own dead body that I had to be food for the journey all rivets and the like must make. Under the floor, I could feel the deep spindle of rock within the ridge of rock narrowly holding me up, holding us up forever. The whole ridge went, the pillar went as I went, the rivets saved. So elsewhere, I've spoken of barrows as representational places in the way they incorporate time and place. And perhaps that explains why they can be gathered out and opened, opened out, gathered up and opened out into history and landscape by poets who I think we ought to read, not because they are writing about barrows, but because they almost always make connections that we haven't thought of. Um, so I think Riley's juxtapositions create new links of meaning between things and a gesture of care towards those prehistoric people who, as he puts it, are at the vanishing point. Um, what he's trying to do is to make them welcome, to say to them, enter our reach, tell us all, tell us if. And similarly, the way this section of Dowlow Drop intrudes and is embedded into the longer poem that meditates on suicide, for example, seems to me to show how archaeology and prehistory can acquire this wider relevance as part of the, the narrative of, of life. So um, archaeologists uh, have become more used, I think, to collaborating with, with visual artists, but perhaps less so, um, again, until today, <laughs> with poets and creative writers. Um, 
So one, most of us could never write like Riley and Fisher, but could we perhaps write differently? Um, is this kind of poetry too difficult for a general audience, or is it more immediate than sort of our standard prosaic archaeological texts? What if the form of our writing responded to the fragmentary nature of our evidence, the interpretive process, the layering of the landscape? Uh, what kind of text could we write then? Thank you.